The Sanctuary Lifetime Service Award is conferred each year upon someone who inspires us, offers us hope, and demonstrates courage and wisdom for young people to emulate. Today, as we struggle to free ourselves from grave ecological threats, we found a man whose existence has been dedicated to securing the life support assets, India's forests, rivers, mountains, coasts, wetlands, grasslands, and deserts, and 1.3 billion people. He stands tall for his dignity and grace, good humor, and persistence in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Charismatic and meticulous, for over half a century, this cultured visionary has walked India's wilds, drafted policies, catalyzed action for lesser known endangered species, and initiated pioneering conservation product, projects. He drafted the groundbreaking Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, the saving grace for India's wildlife. As collector Mandla, he helped save the central Indian race of critically endangered hard ground Barasingha deer. As a member secretary of the task force, he helped formulate the very concept of Project Tiger in the 1970s. And his relentless efforts led to a ban on the export of snake and crocodile skins and furs from India. This colossus then went on to establish Project Snow Leopard and draft the first guidelines for wildlife tourism in India. The list, I promise you, is longer. Director of the Ganga Project, member of the National Board of Wildlife, director of WWF India, and currently chairman of the path-breaking Wildlife Trust of India, M.K. Ranjit Singh is a living legend and inspiration, a protector of all things wild and free. This we honor him. May I request Himendra Guthari, Chairman DSP Blackrock, founder of the Wildlife Conservation Trust and one of India's finest tiger champions, as we've so well discovered this evening, to please join us and present Dr. M. K. Ranjit Singh with the Sanctuary Wildlife <laughs> Service Award. Director of Wildlife of India, 85% of 
of our national parks and sanctuaries, where the old hunting reserves of the princes of India and of the British. And it was interesting that the states, the princes who were most interested in hunting, had the best and the largest wildlife population, whatever we have been able to achieve. Uh, in the early stages was because of the political patronage and the support. <clears throat> One had only to sort of bring it to the notice of the powers that be that this is something that was desired by the Prime Minister of India. And it went through. <clears throat> India is hierarchy. And therefore, what if the, if the boss, if the Prime Minister, is interested than the chief ministers of that party at least are interested. And if they are interested, then the bureaucracy is also interested. And therefore, it's a, a top-to-down situation. Um, <clears throat> this is ironic because in my opinion, India is one developing country where they could have been groundswell from above, from below. This is a country where there is a empathy for nature, there is respect for life, there is vegetarianism, and there, is, there are communities who are dedicated, dedicated to conservation. It is the failure of all of us, government, individuals like myself and the media, that we have not been able to harness this, this commitment. It should change and it must change, and it is changing. But till that time it changes, it is the bounden duty of the government to give that leadership for conservation. And therefore I was very enthused by what the Honourable Chief Minister just now said. And he said it from sincerity and from the heart. And that was very, very encouraging. And I was also very encouraged when he spoke of Praveen Pardesi. <clears throat> um, not that Praveen requires um, <laughs> support or recognition, but it is very encouraging for a bureaucrat, and I'm an ex-bureaucrat, to have his boss on a public podium recognize his contribution. And therefore, I see hope in Maharashtra, and I see hope in India, because I know the Prime Minister is also interested. And when he gave me <coughs> the, 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 the opportunity, when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, and I had gone to see him about the bus stop. He said that he was not only interested in the saving of the bus stop, but he was interested in saving the grasslands, which is more important because that's the mother of all grassland species, including the bus stop. But he went one step further. He said he wanted the cheetah back in India, but then he was the chief minister of, of Gujarat. And he said, he told me that there would be some areas in Gujarat. Uh, where the Chita could come back. So that is his interest, and I think we should all harness that and, and, and utilize it. <clears throat> I have been very fortunate <clears throat> uh, to have worked with people who were dedicated. That was my greatest privilege. Uh, we didn't have money in those days, but we had men, and men come for much more. And these men <clears throat> were not only committed, but they did not seek award for themselves. Having been in the system of government, government gives awards to them, but having been in the system, I know how government gives awards. And therefore, I held those people in greater esteem who have not received awards than those who have received awards from the government. Because, because that means, that implies that these people have not groveled, they have not compromised, they have not lobbied. <laughs> and these were, these were the people whom I had the privilege to work with. But today, today when this award has been given, I seek an award from the government. And I seek an award from the from, from the state of Maharashtra, and I'll come to that. Unfortunately, the chief minister has had to leave. But nonetheless, Praveen is there. <laughs> so, 
I beseech and seek and award a reward from the government. And that reward is that I beseech and seek is that not only in my lifetime, but at least in the 21st century, no species, big or small, should be allowed to go extinct. The, uh, the, the extinction which now will take place will not have been an accidental incident. They would have been extinction which have been allowed to happen. Because we know the predicament of these species. Unlike that of the cheetah which happened, because they were, they were people didn't know. And that, that's a different story. But this is unpardonable. It is unforgivable if it does happen. And if this old man is to be rewarded, rewarded anyway, I would request the government that to ensure that no species in this century is allowed to go extinct. And as far as Maharashtra is concerned, <coughs> I would uh, request uh, that <coughs> they could consider. Um, they're doing a wonderful job, the leadership that we have, and they are wonderful people in the field whom I have had the privilege to know and work with. Um, that there are areas where they could consider the, the return of that prodigal to the native soil of India, the cheetah. The <coughs> cheetah is not about a single species. Yes, it is the only animal, large mammal, we have lost in peninsular India in, the, in historical times. And therefore we want him back, not for the species alone, but what it represents. It represents God, <coughs> it represents species, Godfatherless species of grassland and Godfatherless ecosystems grasslands. And we have more livestock than any country of the world. There is no grassland policy. There is a forest policy where there is a small mention and I happen to be associated with the framing of that. And despite whatever we tried, it was secondary. They are the most productive ecosystems on land, grasslands. Our livestock depends upon it and they are all free grazing. And we all know there is no such thing as free, free lunch in nature. There is no grassland policy. The cheetah represents grassland, and we have other endangered species which are on the verge of going. The buster, the floricans, the barasinga, the manipusta. And therefore, we need this forest. And just like the forest was responsible for the, for the project tiger, it was the forest. Please remember that. It was not the other way around. It was the forest that led to the tiger. And the first nine areas they selected didn't have the largest number of tigers. They represented the diverse ecosystems and habitats that this great animal inhabited. And that should be the approach, not the cat before the horse, or the cart before the horse, sorry. <laughs> you must remember this. There is a saying in Gujarati. Let a lack die, let, let not the savior of those lack die. It's the habitat which saved those, those animals. Let's not forget the trees for the world. And that is why, that is the whole system that we should be looking at. I spoke about the Manipur deer. Um, I believe there is a cash award that goes with this award. And uh, I spoke with Bindu that I would like it to be disposed of in a certain way. And he has asked me, ordered me, that I should mention it here. And therefore, I, I, I do so with some humility. Um, <clears throat> there are many young people uh, who go to the forest and who do not and have seen this. And this is a suggestion which comes from my grandson. And therefore, I think I should implement it. 
um, <coughs> that uh, don't have binoculars and they cannot identify birds and they don't have the money to buy a pair of binoculars. So I would, I would like a part of that award money to go and I would like the Sanctuary magazine to select these in the country. People from the age of 13 to 15 who are uh, not economically strong enough to buy a pair of binoculars, they could be given to them. The other is, uh, um, I've just come back from Manipur and uh, um, after a gap of 20 years, I counted seven, six, uh, 14 animals in 1975 and that made that animal the, the, the rarest large mammal in the world um, at that point in time. It is still one of the rarest animals in the world and uh, it is in one habitat only. And I would like the rest of the money to form a small corpus and uh, the the proceeds of it could be given to those who help uh, in prevention of poaching in that area. Once again, I would like to thank all of you for being so patient. Thank you. So I think you are you are probably one of the only people here who's uh, witnessed um, not only decades of change, but also um, you've seen and been part of policy change. I've read the Wildlife Protection Act. It's it's. It's incredible, um, from policy to being on the ground and all of these decades of change and all of the things that you have seen. Can you just sum up for us what is really imperative for people to know and do as far as uh, wildlife conservation is concerned? The empathy, the commitment, and that comes from either the background or exposure. Uh, exposure to nature, exposure to uh, iconic species. It's a species which lead to the, the uh, broader perspective of conservation of the habitat and from the habitat you move on to nature and an ecosystem or a landscape approach. And uh, it's, it's difficult the other way around. The government must have a visualization of, uh, of, the, uh, of the habitat about which I talked. But for the layman or for the school children, it has to start from some iconic species and therefore one has to select iconic species which represent diverse ecosystems. For the, for the forests, the tiger is perfect. For the mountains, the snow leopard is ideal. For the marine areas, probably the whale shark. Whale shark. For the rivers, the dolphin, the Gangetic dolphin, which today was shown, and which has now been declared as the, as the national aquatic animal. For the grasslands, it should be the great Indian buster. Or, as I said, it could then elevate itself to probably the cheetah someday. Uh, for the wetlands, we can again think of the Siberian crane, but we have lost it as of now. And therefore, we can think of the Saras. If you have these, uh, you see, in India, uh, and the majority um, population religion, they go round iconic species or idols. And therefore, if you have an idol, like the tiger, like the snow leopard, like the lion, then when you, when people get uh, uh, committed about it and passionate about it, then you, you graduate to the next stage. The thing is that, uh, as I was mentioning in my, uh, India is ripe for this. India, we have the basic ethos and the milieu. 
it's unfortunate that we have not cashed in on it or not, or not been able to uh, translate it into action. For a groundswell of fee, in a democracy you must have a groundswell. People themselves must want it. And in some communities it has happened. I have been uh, associated with Manipur since 1972. And I went again after a big gap just uh, three, four days ago and I've come back. And there are people who are committed to, uh, to, to the Sangai. And because they are converted to the Sangai, their Sangai, which is the Manipur deer, they want to save that unique habitat of Kaibul Lamjau, which is the only habitat. And it's just um, 40 square kilometers, but it's less actually in, in, in real terms. So, if you get this, these kind of flagship species, whale shark in the ocean, and, and, and a rallying point, then you could convert that to, into conservation action.